I try I try to pick the pieces in my mind Put them in a pretty little line For you to see I try, try Hello everyone and welcome to a very special episode of Dear DM a Dungeons & Dragons advice podcast where each episode I sit down with a different dungeon master in order to discuss, debate, and hopefully answer your D&D related questions. I'm terribly sorry about the delayed release this week, we had some technical difficulties and lost audio, but it kind of worked out in the end because today, March 1st, is the launch of a wonderful new collective of nerds uh, called Nerdsmith. Nerdsmith is a network of various different artists and content creators working together to bring nerdy entertainment to everyone. And uh, we are beyond proud to be a part of this band of nerdy content creators. Please check us out at www.nerdsmith.org and check out the many wonderful programs that are coming your way. Uh, I'm super excited to see um, all that comes out of this because there's so many talented and wonderful and genuinely lovely people working on this. Uh, before we begin, like always, I want to encourage you all to submit your questions so that we can answer them on the air. Uh, if you would like to hear yours on a future episode, please submit it either to us on Twitter, at DearDMPodcast, or in an email to DearDM.Submit at gmail.com. The more questions you send in, the more content we can create for you, and the happier I'll be. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with another proud Nerdsmith contributor, uh, Sarah. Sarah is the host and dungeon master for the Roll Like a Girl podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. Thanks for having me, Joe. I'm I'm still really excited. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be good fun. I'm very excited to uh, start working with you all in the Nerdsmith community now that we're all yeah. joining up. It's a great community. There's a lot of really enthusiastic people, so I'm looking forward to see what else we've got holding in our future. It- it is it is the beginning of a wonderful journey. So, um, yes. for those at home who don't know, tell us a little bit about Roll Like a Girl. How do you guys get started? Uh, what's what's your your podcast game kind of about? So uh, we got started. I've kind of had this idea about a year ago that I wanted to do a podcast with people I could relate to very easily. Mm. Uh, so I asked one of my Tumblr friends, Theron. Uh, she and I have been messaging each other about nerdy stuff for over a year. And I asked her, you know, what do you think about this? I'm kind of wanting to do this project. Would you be interested in doing it with me? And she was all on board. I was like, okay, cool. That's at least one person (laughs) maybe interested. And uh, I asked my sister, Lauren. um, She's my twin sister. She actually got into the podcast thing before we even started Roll Like a Girl. And Mm. I knew she was kind of busy, but she wanted to to be a part of the, the project. And... We found Livy. <laughs> we, we found Livy in a random group discussion about new players in D and D, and she made a comment she'd never played D and D before. I'm like, well, you know, hope she doesn't mind as a podcast, but I, you know, I want to give her a chance to play. Mm-hmm. So we got her from there, and then um, Nikki. Nikki was Theron's friend beforehand. They play games together. Uh, and Theron brought her on to the project, and and I was very pleased. Uh, how well we clicked together um you know we kind of feed off each other's silliness and inspiration and stuff like that so the podcast itself is set in a homebrew world uh, i've created called navarn um it's kind of like the love child of mine i've always had an idea for this world building exercise and now i'm getting to put it into play and put it in a podcast so that's kind of fun Mm. But uh, the girls are brought together by an adventuring guild called the Adventurers Enclave. As is tradition. Uh, as is tradition, <laughs> yes. Uh, the goal of the Enclave was to help pe- bring people together and kind of give them experience about what's going on in the world and give them jobs to do so they could get paid. So they meet at a job board and <laughs> I gave them a lot of options as to what they could do. You know, uh, it was kind of fun making up the, the game there. Mm-hmm. And they decided they're going to take on a moving company and they're going to be the four girls in a wagon. And once they named themselves like that, you know, it just, it started off really well. Uh, And escalated too, very quickly. There's these mystical stones that they have to gather in order to stop an, I want an evil ancient dragon from coming back to rise. And they are trying to get the help from another dragon who's, who knows about the stones. And it's just... Finding the stones and kind of working together and 
seeing what their actions impact their surroundings. And it's, it's really fun to watch them play. Yeah, it's fantastic. I've only just started listening recently, but even just from what I've heard, it's so much fun. And I will always remember, like, in the first 15 minutes or something to the effect, like all good parties do, they spend a good 15 (laughs) minutes hijinxing in the starting area. and It gets worse. (laughs) (laughs) It gets worse. But just, like, the the first time I heard, like, roll an acrobatics uh, check to climb the job board... I was like, okay, this is the right kind of group. This is going to be fun. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and she got a nat 20 on that roll too. So that could, <laughs> that, that could not set the tone anymore. I don't know what will. Exactly. Um, so how about your, your personal experience? How did you get into D&D and, and DMing in particular? Um, so about seven years ago, I was just getting into college. Mm. Um, it was the first time I've actually been by myself. I've always had friends around. I've always had my sister around, my twin sister. So she went off to college in the neighboring town, but she lived there. She didn't, So I didn't see her as much. So I was like, I need to get out and meet more people. So I joined a knitting club, as one does. Mm. And one of the ladies in the knitting club was trying to recruit somebody else into their Pathfinder game. And so I happened over here and I was like, hey, you know, I don't know what y'all are talking about, but it sounds like my cup of tea. Can I, you know, come check it out, see what's going on? And that's how I met my soon-to-be godmother and godfather. Wow. <laughs> and uh, we're still playing the same campaign we started. It's uh, Rise of the Rune Lords. And uh, they just kind of, they spurred that. They started it. So it went from Pathfinder to D&D. And I actually started playing D&D 5e uh, a year and a half ago. And I've, I've always loved telling stories. Mm. I always like teaching people things. So being a DM just kind of... It felt it felt right, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one of those things I've I've thought about. Is that like uh, for me, being a player in a D and D game very much scratches my itch as an actor. Like if I mm-hmm. if I want to play a role, but being a DM scratches my itch as a writer. It's it's yeah. very much the ultimate testament to I want to build the world, I want to build characters, and then release them and see what people do with it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so that's awesome. Uh, do we want to go ahead and jump in and get to the meat and potatoes, start answering some questions for the good folks at home? That's the best way to do it. Indeed, indeed. All right, our first question is actually kind of similar to what we've been talking about, but mm-hmm. um, they say, I am having real trouble finding a reliable group. I've tried playing online, and every time so far the group falls apart within a few sessions. I also tried to get my in real life friends to play, but no one's schedules line up often enough. How do I find a group I can regularly play with? And that's from Ain't No Party. Oh, that sounds sad. Mm -hmm. Um, What I have done in the past and what I've seen done is I'm involved in a ton of Facebook groups. uh, One for Pathfinder and one for D&D and one for our local area. Uh, There's always somebody out there looking for a group. They may not advertise it, but they're going to be out there. Uh, My suggestion is to hit up your game shops if you have any in the area. If you don't have any in the area, uh, put some feelers out on Craigslist. I know that kind of sounds a little skeptical, Mm -hmm. but you'll be surprised at how many responses you get. And then just, you know, casually talk about it in your conversation. Some people have always been interested in playing D&D and just don't know how to start or don't know how or where to look for. So, you know, mention in casual conversation with somebody new even you may think it's nerdy but you'll be surprised at the response you get i've had very good luck with it oh yeah that's like one of my favorite memories of D D was um because you, you you never know who's been interested all along but you also never know who mm-hmm. might be interested because i remember in college i was rooming with uh two track athletes who had never done anything nerdy in their lives and uh they i i started talking about like what D D was and like that that sounds cool we should we should do that and we spent yeah. just like i think an eight hour session one night getting them introduced to D and they were into it and like I, if i had never brought it up to these people who normally would have no interest in whatsoever we never would have started playing so no no and uh one of the cool things is is i've seen it happen my husband runs a group and we didn't know how to pull them together. His mom wanted to play. She's never played D&D. Well, she's played D&D before, but it was a long time ago. Mm. But she really wanted to play again. And we kept putting feelers out and she kept asking people. And the first 
session that we had, um, there was a nice lady there. She was 80 years old. Hmm. And she never played D&D, never did anything fantasy related. And she she said she was just always been interested, but always, you know, never found the time or never found the reason to do it. So you'd be, you'd be surprised at who answers that call. Yep. It's, it's awesome. Especially with 5e being such a good jumping in point. It's so beginner friendly. Yep. Oh my goodness, it's so friendly. I will say it was like, uh, I did at one point uh, start, I had a group of friends who had never played it before. And I was like, oh, you know what? The the starting module for 5e, the Lost Minds of Fandelver, that's made for introducing people to D&D. But yeah. it was almost too good for that because I looked at them like, oh, it's like four goblins in a cart. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to get real bored running this, so I, I threw it out. But if it's a new DM and a new group, then it's a fantastic option. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why I love it so much. Yep. And I will say for online groups who fall apart relatively regularly, um, that's something that can happen. But if you find the right group, particularly, it's best if you can find a group you can relate to outside of D&D terms. Um, yep. I know one thing I did, one thing I had to search for was a group that was particularly... Um, not that it was difficultly hard to find, but it was uh, LGBT friendly because you know that's it's a more. I, I have a good amount of friends who, same as I am, are members of the LGBT community, and that's always mm-hmm. a fear. But when you meet someone online, you're playing like, oh, when's this gonna come up? Are these people cool with this kind of thing? But if you find the right community, then not only are you gonna be playing the game together. You're going to be able to talk outside of the game, and then you're going to want to meet up regardless of whether you're playing or not. So if you can find a community like that, you'll be good to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, we answered that pretty thoroughly. Our next question is a little bit more fun and playful, a little bit less heavy, but um, I love the username for this. (laughs) Um, The next question is, as a player, when you get to play, what is your favorite dump stat for your characters? (laughs) <laughs> and that's from the wholesome ham. <laughs> I love it. Yep. Oh, favorite dump stat. Mm-hmm. It's a difficult question. They're all good. It, they are all really good, and I always hesitate to do it. But uh, charisma, dump stat, charisma. <laughs> really? I, I, <laughs> yeah. That's... Um, my characters are usually like wizards or not wizards, uh, druids. You know, mm-hmm. something that based is based on wisdom mm-hmm. uh, charisma i just tank in it it's probably because i'm awkward <laughs> <laughs> see that's the thing is that i'm awkward in real life but i love playing the chris that's the thing is like i know charisma is like the standard dump stat mechanically makes and yeah. everything but i've always got to play the social like either super deceptive or super persuasive character that's just some that's like my go-to kind of thing <laughs> but yeah for the dump stat I will definitely say lately it's been strength, just because I've been trying out a couple different classes that don't really need strength at all. But for Ooh, what classes? Oh, um, definitely looking at, I think my next character for when I get to play next, which who knows when that'll be, um, <laughs> is definitely going to be the new Hexblade. Uh, I really Ooh. I really like the combo of charisma to, to uh, attack and uh, damage, so that yeah. I can be like a really like life- you know, not super bulky fighter in in RP, but also carry around like a halberd. Like, I just like the mental yeah. image of like strength based weapons with a with a life character. But between that and you know, uh, I still want to play a um, a rogue at some point. I haven't gotten to play much mm-hmm. of rogue in Five E. A couple different ones, you know, a bunch of different ones that I can drop strength in. But I will say my favorite one I've actually done so far in 5e is dumping uh, intelligence. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really fun to let go and be the dumbass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Someone usually is and takes one for the team. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, do, you have, do you have a particular character you've ever had that you're like, you dumped one so hard it was like, this is going to be fun? Um, you know, I've DM'd too much. I'm trying to think. <laughs> Of one that I did that with. Oh, I played a. Uh... <laughs> oh no! Oh, okay, it's, it's Pathfinder. Okay, this is gonna be good. This is a Pathfinder character, and this is um, an evil campaign I played in. Hmm. I did not stick with it for too long because, uh, um, but I played a Blood Rager. Mm. And when I built my Blood Rager, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> 
I didn't read. For those at home, and totally not me at all, for those who don't know, um, what is a Blood Rager in Pathfinder? Blood Rager <laughs> is an angry... Just think about like taking a barbarian and a sorcerer, and you just you mash the class together. Ah. Um, so it's a it's a rager who can use their powers to cast spells or rage in battle. Okay. Um, but the required um, scores that you need in order to build a successful one is strength and charisma. Mm. I didn't know this going in. <laughs> Um, so I dumped all of my stats into Charisma to cast the spells. Uh. I thought it was, yeah, I thought it could go to, it didn't go together well. Uh, so she died <laughs> very early on. I was a little bit okay with that, but it was, it was a mess. <laughs> yep. It was just a mess. It's surprising though. Sometimes you can get really bad characters to survive very long just by either luck or like I've had a character go through a, a lot with really low HP, really bad HP rolls, just because <laughs> he was a coward. That's he was he was a one hundred percent coward. So anytime <laughs> anything happened, I'm like, all right, he hides behind the pillar and then sh- shoots out a firebolt. That's all he does. <laughs> so if I learned anything from D and D, it's that cowards always prosper. Um, yes. <laughs> and on and on that note. Um, do we want to jump to the middle game that we have here at Dear DM where we make some characters? Yeah, I'd love to make characters. It's my favorite thing in the world. Yeah, I mean, mine too. Um, for, those, uh, for those of you at home who haven't uh, listened yet, uh, each week we do a little game in the middle where we use these random tables I've made for different character race, background, class, and uh, character trait. And we generate a few interesting characters. We choose our favorite, and then all you talented folks out there make whatever comes to mind. Either a drawing, a bio, a short story. Um, Notedly, I've already declared Travis Mattingly our official artist because he's killed it every week. Um, Everything he... Go check it out. It's uh, on the Twitter. It's... Everything is hilarious. He recent... His most recent one was the the previous one that was the... um, tabaxi monk who follows bounty hunter who follows all follows of, the law follows every law and it's just him like with his his uh quarry across the street he's like oh i can't jaywalk mm. i'm like it's so good but go ahead and check that out um but we're gonna make some characters and if it inspires you to make anything please send it in to us and i i just love seeing that stuff so uh do you have a d20 ready sarah but of course awesome uh, then we're going to go ahead and get started. Why don't you go ahead and make the first roll, which will be for race. Okay, okay. Six. Six is Dragonborn. Okie dokie. All right. Uh, then profession. It's another d20 here. Fourteen. Fourteen is artist. Okay. That's a... That, I've, I've never made a Dragonborn artist before, so... Um, <laughs> background is the next one. Uh, five. Five is folk hero. Okay, interesting. And let's let's make the character a bit weird with their character quirk. Uh, okay. An eleven. Eleven is personally offended when mail is misdelivered. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm picturing. I'm almost picturing like if he's a folk hero artist. I'm almost picturing a Banksy type of dragonborn. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like legend legendary artist who's just kind of you know set up in a town but also gets very angry about his mail <laughs> i don't know i kind of imagine not so much banksy as just so much stick figures <laughs> <laughs> so they're <laughs> learning how to learning how to do it <laughs> so they're an artist but they're not necessarily a good artist <laughs> not the world's best artist <laughs> But it's so distinctive, like they know who it is. Mm, true, it's it's a very distinct style of stick figure. You can always pick it out. <laughs> All right, so that's a good one. But let's let's make a couple more options. Uh, let's let's start okay, at the okay. beginning with race again. Yeah, uh, that's a natty one. A uh, natural one for race is going to be human. That's a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As as I generally treat all my characters, it's it, human is the net one of races. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, and then profession. Uh, two. Two is barbarian. Okay, rage human. And then background. Thirteen. Sailor. Hmm. 
potentially a drunken raging sailor. And then it gets interesting with the quirk. Uh, 15. 15 is tone deaf, but loves to sing loudly. So, <laughs> so far, this just sounds like a very extravagant sailor to me. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine some whole I don't know why he has to be old but he has to be old <laughs> on a deck singing really loudly and gets mad whenever somebody tells him that he's singing the words wrong oh, Jesus oh god the, the one like the, maybe this ship in particular had a lot of rowing songs that really the the crew really loved and this guy joined and like oh we have to stop we, we, we can't do that anymore <laughs> oh it's that guy again oof Dave's here mm. <laughs> oh Okay, so that's another good option. Let's make a... That's why it rages so much. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Why don't you stop singing? <laughs> Come on, guys. We're only on the second verse. There's four more. <laughs> what to do with the drunken sailor? <laughs> oh, God. All right, so let's make a third potential child, and then we'll choose our favorite. Ooh, okay. Uh, a 13. That's a goblin. Gobbers. Okay. Gabbo. It's a natural 20 on the next step there. <laughs> okay. That's the first time we got a natural 20 on this one. That's a goblin daycare attendant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should go on. I'm afraid now. I'd be happy just having the idea of a goblin daycare attendant. But, but via the all important rules of this game, we have to continue. <laughs> We have to continue. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, 16. 16 is... Let's re-roll that one because we did that recently. That's anthropologist. Yep. Uh, 14. 14 is soldier. Okay. Oh, this is getting worse. <laughs> Almost like a drill oh, bit no. Taylor goblin daycare attendant. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then let's make it even weirder with the quirk. <laughs> that's, a, that's a four for the quirk. Uh, at least 10 minutes late to any appointment. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. So we've got a, a, a wonderful disaster child there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the image by itself is awesome. <laughs> I just, I imagine that this, like, this, this goblin is fairly new to this pro profession. Like, <laughs> entirely incompetent, <laughs> but doing their best. <laughs> And spoke at a child to get him to shut up. <laughs> and the children... No, you've eaten enough. <laughs> and they're about the same height, so the children aren't all that intimidated. <laughs> it tries to try so hard to be intimidated, just fail. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Oh, okay. That's a good option. I love that one. That's so good. So, I'm I'm going to leave it to you, but I have an idea of which one is going to end up being our favorite. Oh, it's the goblin. It's the goblin. Yeah, it's, I can't not choose the goblin. <laughs> that is a very good option. That's our second goblin here, but it's different enough and lovely enough that I'm going to go ahead and say this is a fantastic option. Uh, you can never have enough goblins, in my opinion. No. Uh. No, never. Never, never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you at home know what to do. If you're inspired by a goblinoid daycare attendant who is a f potentially former soldier... <laughs> and is always late, then uh, please, please make uh, some fan art or a bio or please. whatever inspi whatever you're inspired to do. Um, I will love to see that. Please submit that to us either on Twitter, at DearDMPodcast, or send it to us in an email, uh, at DearDM.Submit at gmail.com. Um, it, it makes my week to see all that. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, let's let's get back to our our true quest, our true adventure Ooh, here. We seek the truth, indeed. Alrighty. So this next one is from Deviston, who asks, "How do you identify knowing too much as a DM and bringing yourself into the player perspective to know when you need to explain something in great detail? For example, I know all about Country X, and I know that in Country X, the guards are conscripted." but they tend to enjoy their lives. If this is information is critical, how do I remind myself that I need to attempt to convey that in some way? I find myself backtracking a lot, trying to convey something that I knew, but I forgot that the players didn't, and they needed to know it for some conveying of a good story plot point. So basically, how do you remind yourself to think of what the players know versus what you know? Hmm. That is a very good question. 
Um, I look at what my player's history is in the area. Um, if, for one, if they don't ask questions about, you know, the guard structure or how it is structured, the government structure of the area, you know, I just, I'll make some comments here like, oh, um, you talk to this tavern owner over here and they drop hints or drop some small mentions about the Jarl. Um, in this case, you know, it could be something that you might have to write down in your notes when you're describing a town or a scene or something. So whenever I introduce my players to a new town, I go into a full description mm. um, about what they would be seeing. So I know that I mentioned the things that they need to see. For instance, uh, when my players walked into a highly magical town and they had a system set up to where they checked magic items i made sure i noted that hey you guys are getting ready to walk through the gates but these guys in blue robes stop you and they check your items you recognize this you know system as the magical check-in system Mm -hmm. it's just incorporating it into the into the area that they're doing so guards you know they could hear something happen at a table where somebody complains loudly about conscription Mm mm-hmm just just little things like that. Yeah, and I would I would add on to that saying one thing I would always do is make sure that if it's a really important detail I need to make sure it gets through somehow, I would always make sure that there's mm-hmm. some indication that the players can use their senses in particular to find out. I.e. something yeah. they can see, something they can hear, something they can smell, I guess. Um, but like, for instance, in this case, you could say that all the constructed guards have an interesting tattoo... And that'd give you an excuse to bring up the tattoo. It would get the players curious. Um, and then they could ask someone and find out that information. Or, you know, as long as there's something, especially if it's a new town to something, something that would stand out from the ordinary. Even if it's not, like, immediately a big sign saying, oh, there's conscription here. It'll be something mm-hmm. that they're at least interested in and will then pursue information about. Yep. And then an- another thing you can always do is tie it to an NPC. If they happen to run into Gerald the guard who is conscripted, there's a higher chance that they're going to learn from Gerald about it than, you know, if they didn't have that friend, Gerald. Yep, that's good, that's good advice. Little red flags. Indeed. Or big red flags. Um, depending. Which, whichever way you want to go. <laughs> yes. Or in some case in my campaign, enormous red flags that overshadow the entire city. Um, <laughs> but um, let's move on to our final question for this episode um, and that is from Isaac who asks how can I make a villain more dramatic slash interesting my players just slew their first big bad and it felt a little bit hollow when they just saw him in the lair attacked before he could do even like an evil monologue or anything and then looted the body after killing him <sighs> so how can you make a, a, a villain a bit more interesting than a sack of hit points and a loot drop I would, hmm, that's, I had that problem where they killed my villain in the middle of a monologue, <laughs> um, <laughs> which was funny, by the way, but, yeah. um, you know, build him, build him up, mm. make him talk of the town or whispers even of the town, um, kind of display their power, talk a game, you know, start the rumors, spread them out. Um, and they don't even have to necessarily be the bad guy. Um, uh, you could, and for instance, you know, the town is being investigated by the players and there's whispers of a witch in the wood and it's that one witch that everybody's afraid of when really it's just a druid practicing her magic. Um, but, you know, like build up a big scare factor and then just wait for them to kind of get their senses about and wait for them to kind of forget a little bit about how dramatic you can be and then make a big moment. Mm-hmm. Make it a standout moment. Yeah. Uh, just kind of hit them when they're not expecting it to be. Yeah, I think I I, I wholeheartedly agree because that's that's one of those things that is just the act of even displays of power before the final confrontation are so important because mm-hmm. they set up stakes and they set up motivation. Um, so, for instance, if you have an evil baron and you're just taking it on other folks' word that the baron is evil, then it doesn't really have too much impact when your players finally get there and fight. Um, but if, for instance, the baron had kidnapped a friend of the party and gave them false charges and they had to rescue the, the NPC or the NPC got killed or whatever, they now have a personal stake against the baron. And you can yep. just build that up as you go. And mess with their morales. 
Mm. You know, um, give, don't just go, oh, I have this big bad baron. Give a baron that has a family mm. yeah. that, you know, has a conscious, like his soup, his wife is super duper nice. You know, yep. <laughs> make it make it a little challenging to him. Make him morally invested in it. Yep. One of one of my favorite villains uh, that I've pretty much entirely stole the character concept from Critical Role for was essentially <laughs> the evil version of Percy. Um, oh, for sweet. for those who haven't watched too much Critical Role, Percy is the person who, in the fiction, invented the gun through a deal with a demon, whatever. Um, but super sad backstory. Yeah, tragic. Who? Love him. Quick plug, I am playing in Cantata Pond Sophical, which uh, by the time this uh, episode comes what? out, it will it will be out, so go check that out. End of plug. Joe! <laughs> but... I didn't know! You didn't? Oh, yeah. No! No, no. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, You're welcome. It's, it's fun. Um, it, like, it's such an amazing project. Like, just to, just to glow about it for a bit, like, so many people are involved, and it's such, like, I've never seen a fan project yeah. like it before. Um, it's going to be awesome. Indeed. So go check that out. But um, the villain that I based upon it was, his whole thing was he, unlike Percy, started manufacturing guns on a large basis, um, which became a problem. He became a little totalitarian. But the whole reason was that he knew about a threat to the nation that most people didn't know about. And he was preparing, albeit in a ruthless way, to protect his homeland. So even though he came into conflict with the players and he wasn't morally, you know, justified in a lot of the things that he did, it was still more than just, oh, I want power. I want to overtake everything. It was, I want to pre protect this land kind of thing. Somebody once told me that one of the greatest villains they've ever had was a villain with good intentions. Mm -hmm. That is that is an always, always a good way to say it. Oh, yeah. Especially if they find that out partway through or afterwards. <laughs> Sometimes oh, yeah. sometimes it's best to let that little bit of guilt for killing the morally questionable person come in after the killing. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, unless I'm mistaken, I think that's all we're going to... Uh, that's uh, all the questions for today on here, dear DM. Um, before we go, I just wanted to remind everyone to please send your questions to us either at our Twitter account, at DearDMPodcast, or in an email to DearDM.Submit at gmail.com. The more questions we get, the more content we can produce for all you lovely people, and the happier I'll be. And if you've been enjoying the podcast so far, it would mean the world to us if you could please share it with your friends or give us a review on iTunes. I'm not exactly how how it works, but somehow if you leave us a, revo a, view, a review on iTunes, like we get stronger, we gain power from it somehow. Not entirely sure. All the power! <laughs> exactly. I need We need your spiritual energy via the media, medium of iTunes. Um, yes. Uh, and as always, I want to thank my dear friend Paul Parisa for the use of his song, whether or not. Brilliant, brilliant musician. Had the pleasure of playing with him a bunch of times. Please go check him out on his SoundCloud and everywhere Paul is. Um, and finally, I want to thank all the folks at Nerdsmith for welcoming us into the network. Mm. We're super excited to become members. Um, you can find out all the exciting announcements and info about Nerdsmith on Twitter at WeAreNerdsmith or at www.nerdsmith.org. Um, and that's going to wrap it up for us today. As always, uh, Sarah, I like to end the show with a game tale of some sort, either something funny or interesting or dramatic that happened at your table or at the table you were playing at. So do you have a, a, okay. a particular story that you're fond of? I do, I do, I do. So, picture this. Dark, stormy night on top of a tower, and there is a, a wizard... Mm. A druid, mm -hmm. a, a, a fighter, a cleric, and a rogue fighting a snake lady. Mm. What's her name? I don't. I don't know what they're called anymore. I forgot. Great DM, I know. <laughs> and uh, she decides she's going to nosedive uh, off the tower to escape us, <laughs> um, which doesn't work out well for her or for us because we tied the uh, fighter to the end of a rope <laughs> and sent him after her. And you can imagine how well that went with our cleric. Mm -hmm. Yep. That, that's my story. That's, uh, that is that is quintessential D and D. Tying fighters to things with rope is is and just tossing them. Yep, that's what fighters are for. Everyone knows it. Yeah. Let's just say it. Yeah, they're meat shields. They can they can take it. <laughs> All right, that that's gonna do it for us here on Dear DM. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining me. Um, where can folks find stuff? Uh, where can they find besides Nerdsmith? Uh, everything about um, Roll Like a Girl. 
Uh, so if you are not of the iTunes cl- crowd or Google Play crowd um, and you just want to go directly to our page, uh, you can go find us at turtle.fyi slash roll like a girl. It's all spelled out just like that. Uh, we can be found on Tumblr, though our Tumblr page isn't that active. Same thing, roll like a girl, as is our Twitter feed. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. We feed off energy. Not in like an <laughs> positive, evil, mostly positive not an evil energy. lich kind of way, but no. <laughs> more of a positive, <laughs> fey kind of way. <laughs> the happy lich kind. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that's where you can find us. You can ask us any questions. We enjoy interacting with you guys. Yep. And it's a fantastic podcast. Please go check it out. Thanks. Um, and I will say... You're pretty fantastic too, Joe. Aw, thank you. Don't short sell yourself. <laughs> I will say I did just get... I am totally going to use the Happy Lich as a name for a tavern in one of my games. <laughs> You're welcome. (laughs) But that's going to do it for us. Uh, Thank you all for listening at home. And as always, I don't actually have a catchphrase. Uh, So. That's okay. Uh, Goodbye. Bye.